Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining ARC's weekly fireside chat. Today, we will be talking about police accountability and keeping our communities safe. Uh, with everything that's transpired in the past week, uh, there's a lot to kind of unpack and talk about. Uh, so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, we want to hold space and continue to discuss uh, police violence against our community members. And that, that's just a reality, it's an everyday reality. So today I'm welcoming, welcoming a couple of our, our staff members, uh, Jacob Bravor, ARC Associate Director of Inside Programs, and Mark Taylor, ARC Life Coach. Uh, so Jacob, uh, take a minute to introduce yourself. How are you doing today? And, and, and tell us what is your work as Associate Director of Inside Programs consist of? So hi, my name is Jacob Bravor and as Sam, as mentioned earlier, I am the Associate Director of Inside Programs. Uh, I'm also a former lifer who spent uh, 25 years incarcerated in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Some of my job responsibilities are to uh, oversee or to manage the Hope and Redemption team, which is made up of nine former lifers who return back to prison and, and facilitate character development and self-help groups. Thank you, Jacob. Appreciate you. Thank you for joining the show. And Mark, Mark, how you doing, brother, today? And uh, could you tell us a little bit about your work uh, here as a life coach? I'm doing all right today. Thank you, Sam. It's an honor to be on today's Fireside Chat. My name is Mark Taylor. I'm a former life prisoner who spent 21 and a half years in prison. I'm part of ARC's Hope and Redemption team, and I currently work inside Pelican Bay State Prison, giving the men the tools they need to get home to their families. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. I uh, want to highlight something, uh, uh, one, a bill that, that's pending inside our state legislator, uh, legislature today, Senate Bill 2. You have an opportunity to look up Senate Bill 2. It's the police decertification bill. And it's important in this context. And then we're going to get more into uh, other, other conversations. Uh, California is only one of four states out of 50 that does not have a, a decertification bill. Uh, as you must know, Minneapolis or uh, 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 does not have a, a decertification bill. Or else Derek Chauvin would not have been working as a police officer uh, at that time. And the reason why I say that is because he had, as, as I recollect, and I could be wrong on this, he had 18 claims of, uh, of force, overuse of force, and he had been disciplined twice. Under decertification bill, he would have been removed from the police force and he would not have had his neck on the back of George Floyd's neck. He would not have had his knee on the back of uh, George Floyd's neck. Uh, so if we think about that in the state of California, this is a bill that I think uh, we should all support, make a lot of noise behind. Uh, it's not for police officers that are doing their job right. It's not for police officers that uh, are good police officers, and there are some. Rather, rather, rather we want to accept it or not, there's some, there, there are good police officers. The decertification bill is specifically to make sure that we do not have law enforcement officers that are brutal, that break the law, that harm people. So I just want to put that out there. Senate Bill 2, again, is something that you should definitely look into uh, and support. Uh, I want to get into some of these questions that I have for, uh, for us to discuss. So police are just the first part of a vast criminal justice system. Uh, well, Jacob and Mark, you, you both work with people in prisons. How do you view police now as opposed to, to as opposed today, as opposed to in the past when we were in our mess, so to speak? Uh, Mark, you want to go first? Did I come to you, Jacob? Definitely. Thank you, Sam. So, you know, when I was young, I was engaged in, in criminal activity. So quite naturally, you know, I viewed police officers as adversaries. Now that I'm a law abiding citizen and a black man living in America, I'm still concerned about the heavy police presence in our communities because I know there's an inextricable link between our carceral system and, and police officers out there in our communities. And I know a lot of times this is the first point of contact and we do have a lot of people incarcerated in the state of California. So I am deeply concerned about that and I'm deeply concerned about the way these officers are being trained today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Uh, for me, uh, you know, when I was a young young man, I, the police was the enemy. Um, they were uh, someone who came and took people away that I didn't see for a very long time. Uh, today, I see them as a necessary, uh, for lack of a better term, evil. Uh, and I, I call it evil only because 
uh, the policing, the, the training of the police and the way that they police America today has uh, is, is not equitable and it, it, it marginalizes many communities and keeps many people from exceeding in life. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, so, so in my lifetime, I, I have to say, I, I have to look at both sides in, in this sense. So when I was young, I, the first time I, I had a run in with law enforcement, I was, I was around eight and I was coming from Van Ness Park. I had on a baseball uniform and the baseball uniform happened to be red. It's not my fault that that's the color that the park decided to pick. I was eight years old. And there were a bunch of other youngsters. We were all coming from the park and was headed to this little store to get candy. All of us had uniforms on. We had cleats over our shoulders and the police pulled up and put us on the wall and literally started accusing us of being gang members. So that was my first running with the police as, as a kid. And so as a young person, I always saw that it was adversarial uh, with police and law enforcement. Uh, from that day forward, that was my experience. Uh, since I've been home from prison, uh, I have a number of family members that are actually law enforcement uh, that, that work for the police department. Uh, I've had good run-ins with police and I've had not so good run-ins in the past nine and a half years that I've been home from prison. And so I see uh, a couple of things. One. There's some good people that, that are serving that are trying to do, do their job right. And there's some bad ones. And we have to figure out how to weed out the bad ones. That's just my, my personal opinion. Uh, the, the other thing I, I would like to add, if you haven't seen this film called American Skin, you need to watch it. Yeah. And the reason why I say you need to watch American Skin, it, it, it's about a police killing. But the piece that I took out, out of it was in the midst of a real dramatic scene, one of the police officers said that they were never trained how to de-escalate. Just think about that. Take a look at the film when you have an opportunity. Uh, so, so Jacob, tell me something. Tell me this, and, and we'll all respond to this. How do you feel about police killing, the, the police killings go, you see going on across this country? Uh, it's almost, to me, it's almost like a weekly or everyday event that we see. Uh, well, for me, you know, this is this is it's nothing new. Uh, I believe that this type of stuff has been going on for centuries or decades or however you want to uh, claim it. Uh, I think the only difference today and between today and, and yesteryears is the fact that there's cameras around. So more people are privy uh, to some of the abuse that's going on within the community. Um, uh, a lot of police shootings, I, I, I feel, are, are unjustified. Uh, we have a young man with his hands up, nothing in his hands. Uh, he may have had a gun before, but when he shot him, there was nothing in his hands. And um, I just think that um, the fact that it keeps happening to the minorities, when we see a guy run down the street with a semi-automatic weapon and the police buys him a hamburger and a soda, and then we have young kids with no guns running from the police and getting shot in the back. And I, I just think that that's an issue. That's a problem that something that needs to be uh, addressed. Same question to you, Mark. Like, how, how do you feel about the police killings you see going on across our country? So the, the, these killings, just putting it bluntly, sicken me, and they remind me that our community is not today, nor have we ever been safe in this country. If I get pulled over by an officer today, I'm always in fear. I temper my tone. I keep my hands on the steering wheel. I let them know before I move anywhere in the vehicle, if I have to grab my license in order, in hopes that I will make it through the traffic stop alive. Now, all police aren't bad. You know, I got pulled over probably six months ago. I was doing 10 miles over the speed limit. That officer was actually cool and let me go without you know, without harassing me, without a ticket, he did let me go. But I've had some adverse, you know, experience with police officers since I've been out as well. Uh, I think this is something that needs to change. I think a big part of this is the sy systemic problems that exist within the system itself, because the system itself is the ones who acquit these police officers when we do these things. Now, Derek Chauvin is kind of an outlier because he was found guilty. But we've seen time after time after time police officers kill black citizens on camera. And even if they are arrested at the end, they're acquitted. I think that's a problem and the system has to change. So, so totally agree with you, uh, Mark. We see it time after time, two things. So, so first, Jacob, you spoke on the, the, the young man, the, the child, uh, Adam Toledo that was, that was killed. Uh, 
for me, that was heartbreaking. Uh, a kid, like on the 29th of this month, my grandson will turn 13. That's how Adam Toledo was. He was a kid. And like, I fear for, for my grandson. Uh, like, I literally think about like, I hope and pray that, that he's safe when he's not around me. So that's one, uh, Mark, you spoke about uh, the, the Derek uh, Chauvin uh, being an outlier. I agree. And, and sadly, here, here was the crazy part. This week, when we were waiting for the verdict to be read, I was on pins and needles. Like, literally, I felt relief when he was found guilty because I was so, I was worried that they would find him not guilty and that the world just would explode again. And so for us, for Black people, to just have that worry, like, the, the evidence was irrefutable. There was no way that you couldn't see what he did. And so uh, just, just saying like, we should not have to feel like that in a country that, that's, that we live in. We shouldn't have to. Uh, so, so for me, when I see all these police killings a, 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 across the country in all these different states and, and, and cities, I feel like people need to speak up. They need to speak up on a policy level, like we talked about Senate Bill 2 and other uh, uh, bills to make sure that one, police are taught de-escalation, police are taught mental health, like police need to need to be trained and they need a, a certain level of education, if you ask me, and a certain level of maturity uh, that's necessary for you to go out in the mentality of this warrior mentality of going into the community to do battle needs to be removed. You're going into the community to protect and serve the people that are in the community. You're going into the community to be that person that an eight-year-old kid can wave to and be like, hi, Officer Jones, you should, you should want, and I say this to law enforcement if you're, if you're listening, you should want to be seen as a hero. When you see firefighters, what do you think? You think hero. That's how police officers should want to be seen. But in order for you to do that, you have to remove, you have to stop looking at people that are African American as threats. Uh, uh -huh. next, Sam, go ahead, go ahead, Jacob. But also, I think I think the way that we do policing needs to be changed considerably. What I mean by that is that uh, police officers are not trained to deal with every situation, and uh, they should have a mental health expert in the car with them at all times, just in case they run across a, a mental health patient. Uh, they should have different uh, expertise. Uh, levels for each officer or sets of officers so when they run across a particular problem they can send someone that is well equipped for that problem uh, just having an officer who has most officers have high school diplomas to send them over there uh, to deal with a mental health situation is uh, to me is, is really irresponsible uh, on the state's part or the city's or the county's part so I just wanted to make sure that that was mentioned. I want to highlight something real good real quick so Jared, you're correct. There should be other roles that, that to respond uh, for revolve, resolving situations like mental health, uh, a, a mental health crisis. And I want to give uh, kudos out to LA City Council for working on making that happen. So instead of having law enforcement deployed, you actually have social workers deployed when that when it's a, a mental health issue. Those are some of the changes that that can definitely be implemented when we talk about improving how the system works. But we still have to focus on on, on on some of the just brutal people that serve. And, and this is not Sam saying this. Here's the reality. The attack on the Capitol, the FBI and the rest of, of law enforcement is saying they already know that you have white supremacists in law enforcement. What does that tell you? I'm not. This is not Sam saying this. This comes from the Federal Bureau of Investigation for the United States. So so when we know this is happening, what are we going to do about it now? Uh, uh, wanted, wanted to ask earlier this week, when the verdict came down for former police officer Derek Chauvin as guilty in all accounts of murder uh, for, for George Floyd, uh, ARC advocates against extreme sentences. So what does justice and accountability look like in this case? So, so Mark, we talked a little bit about this, but I want to ask both of you, in this case, because we do advocate as an organization and, and as formerly incarcerated people and as an organization that's led by formerly incarcerated people, uh, we, we advocate for, for against extreme sentences. So in this case, with Derek Chauvin, what does justice and accountability look like in this case? Uh, I, I'll go first. Uh, you know, for me, um, 
I'm totally against the death penalty. So uh, that that's off the table for me. And also life without, I, I think those are extremely uh, extreme sentences or, or really extreme sentences. Um, for me, I think that an uh, indeterminate sentence um, with a minimum of, of maybe a 15 years um, for him for him to be able to go in and and do some rehabilitative work uh, and and become a better person and upon showing that he's a better person being released, I think I think that will be accountability and uh, injustice um, for him to sit in prison for another 30, 40 years. I think would be a he's already up in age and 15, 20 years incarcerated will uh, pretty much take away the rest of his life. So uh, I think I think that that would be uh, justice for me. You don't get in trouble for that one, Jacob, but I actually agree with you, but but uh, I'd like to hear from you, uh, uh, Mark. <laughs> uh, just, just like uh, Jacob, I'm opposed to the death penalty. I'm opposed to life without the possibility of parole. I do believe in accountability and that individuals do have to be account held accountable. They have to be accountable by the state. They have to be held accountable by the family and community, and they have to be held accountable by themselves, right? And this is a process that I had to go through in order to get released. I was sentenced to 26 years to life. In my case, that was a just sentence for a senseless crime. I ended up serving 21 and a half years in prison, and I had to demonstrate that I no longer posed a threat to, uh, to society. I had to admit to the crime, not only in writing, but before two commissioners who were appointed by the governor before they would even consider me for release. Now, Derek Chauvin is not accepted responsibility for this crime. I believe that he there comes a point where he will have to accept responsibility of, for this crime before he is released from prison. He should go through the same rigorous rehabilitative process that I had to go through in order to be found suitable and released back to society. The litmus test should be, does this individual still pose a risk to society? And if he does, he should not be released. Uh, for, I want to go back to, great question, Mark, great response, Jacob. And when I said you're going to get in trouble, I mean, I mean, for other people that don't agree, like, because this is, this is emotionally charged, uh, Watching the video, like people, like it still affects me. Like I was watching CNN last night, and they were showing just where where, where uh, Derek Chauvin's knee was at. It was on his neck. It wasn't on his back. It was on his neck. And and watching the last moments of a human being like die, just like it still shakes me. Uh, and so I agree. I, I'm also opposed to the death penalty. And I agree with you, Mark. The levels of accountability, because I've heard some say, "Well, he's 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 not being held accountable." And I'm like, there are different levels of different ways to be held accountable. First, there's self-accountability. Eventually, Derek Chauvin has to come to the place where he understands what he did wrong and hold himself accountable. No one can do that but Derek Chauvin. And until he does that, to me, there, there, there should be no pathway home because you have to admit what you did was wrong first. And if you can't see that you, what you did was wrong, that means uh, you don't value the human life that you took. Uh, the other two ways of, of being held accountable, in my opinion, uh, is the state, which represents the family. And so if the state prosecutes and incarcerates you, you're being held accountable by the state as a representative of the family. But the family should also have a say so as survivors of this violent crime to be able to say, you know what, we can forgive you, but we still want you to be held accountable. And that, that accountability can come in the form of incarceration. So so there are different levels of account accountability. Uh, so uh, I see we have a, uh, we're gonna tag some of the, some of the things that'll be said in, said in the chat box. I love this. Uh, matter of fact, let me go to, uh, Mark, you make a lot of sense regarding the sentence issue. You gave us lots of food for thought. So, so uh, please keep giving the, the, these pearls of wisdom, Mark and Jacob. Uh, and, and you actually, go ahead, Jacob. I, I, I also just wanted to like, I just wanted to add that we have to be very careful when we talk about the criminal justice system that we don't expect our anger uh, to be um, adhered, to be kind of like catered to. Uh, the criminal justice system is not about revenge, it's about re rehabilitation. And even though uh, watching Chauvin sit on, uh, uh, sit on, uh, um, excuse me, uh, Floyd's neck, and uh, with his hands in his pocket, it, it really, really infuriated me. I have to separate that from the justice part of it. The justice part of it is about the community. It's not about anger. And I think 
uh, a lot of the census laws that has come about has come about because of people's anger instead of people uh, really looking for justice. And we want to be careful not to let that seep into this particular situation. OK, I, I have a really great, great question for both of you. Great. So great. First of all, Jacob, great answer. Uh, please pay attention to the chat because there, there are some people that disagree. And, and I love, uh, uh, so, so I don't think we're helping lifers by advocating for life sentences and rigorous punitive parole board processes. Many people are, are being held in prison unjustly due to these rigorous processes. Uh, Jared, and that, that's from Jared. And so I'll say this, I'll honestly say this, like I just use me as an example. I went to the board nine times, spent 24 years in prison. I killed somebody while I was gangbanging intentionally. OK, so so it wasn't it was not an accident. The first time I went to the board was after 10 years. And I can be fully transparent if they would have released me. This was my mindset, my honest mindset. I still I, I have the reputation. I have the credentials. When I get out, I'm going to unite all of the gangs and I'm going to lead them. That was and, and after 10 years. And so when they denied me four years, I look back and I say, I'm glad they did because had had they not, I probably would have went out and hurt someone else or been murdered myself for being involved. The last two times I went to the parole board, my thinking had totally changed. And so that's why I'm in this work. That's why I've gotten into this work. And I feel like they got it right. They just didn't get it right uh, uh, the eighth time. They should have got it right on the eighth time. Uh, but I'm just being honest, that's, but that's just me too. That's only me. I can't speak for anyone else, but a person knows when they're ready to go home. Because if you're still thinking that you can have one foot in and one foot out, that's still what we call criminal thinking. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark or Jacob, if, you, if you'd uh, like to uh, weigh in. No, I, I, I'll just add real quick. I see uh, Frederick Hayes saying mercy is inclusive and justice. I, I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, I do believe there are some people in prison who could be released today who no longer pose a threat. I think my frust frustration comes in that I don't feel that law enforcement has been held to the same standard. And, and that's the point I'm making. I believe at the very least, law enforcement should be held to the standard that we are being held to, if not more, because they're sworn to protect and serve. Uh, uh, and they're in a position of great power where not only can they take a person's life, they can take a person's freedom and then they can spend, you know, how many ever years and decades in prison. Uh, but I do believe that mercy and compassion and empathy is is justice in a sense. And we do have to temper it with those things. Thank you. I, that was beautiful, Mark. I like on point. Uh, um, go ahead, uh, Jacob. Can I add that uh, just like re rehabilitation is a rigorous uh, activity. Um, and so um, to say that we're advocating for rigorous process, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I think we're, we're, advocating, we're advocating for him to do the work to be a productive human being. And that takes a rigorous process. And, we, and it also takes oversight. It takes somebody to look to make sure that this person is not trying to pull the wool over our eyes or trying to uh, uh, mask who he really is. So the, the rigorous process is, is, is it, it, it's going to be there one way or another because there has to be accountability. And without the rigorous process, there is no accountability, in my opinion. So, so a couple of things. There's a question I'm going to come in that, that's going to also talk about some of the legislation we'll work on. But first, I want to say this. I have a, a family member that works in law enforcement, and this family member just decided that he did not want to be uh, one of the law enforcement. He, he's a process server. And I asked him, I was like, why wouldn't you, like, instead of being a process server? And, he, and, and his words to me, he was like, that's too much responsibility. And I was like, how is it too much responsibility? He said, I would have to have I would literally be carrying life and death on my hip. And I was like, wow, that's deep. Not wanting to move over into the particular part of law enforcement because carrying a weapon means I'm, I'm literally carrying life and death on my hip. That's the type of thoughtfulness that, that you go, go into uh, considering this. Uh, the other part that I was gonna say, Mark, I agree with you. To me, law enforcement should be held to a higher standard always. And the reason why is because they're meant to protect and serve. They're, they have life and death on their hip. And so, yes, when you take a life and it was done in a manner that Derek Chauvin was, was, was done, 
you need to be held to a higher standard. It's, it's that simple. You you cannot go into considering just shooting somebody and, and not or, or uh, uh, kneeling some, on someone's neck for 10 minutes without really considering the repercussions of your actions. Uh, this one I'm going to ask you, this, uh, so, so what does meaningful change in policing in America look like and, and who should lead it? Uh, take a go and then, then Mark. Um, I think that, the, of course, I think it needs to be led by people who are directly impacted by the system. Those that are closest, this is a, a phrase I got from Sam, those that are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. So it should be led by them. And um, the solution, I, you know, I have my own solutions, and, and but I think that the solutions need to come from the community. I think the community needs to come as a whole and figure out exactly uh, how they want to hold people accountable and what that looks like. And uh, I can give some suggestions, but uh, I don't think they would be very popular, <laughs> uh, being that I'm, I'm really, really on the progressive side. Uh, and, and for me, uh, stuff, uh, policing, uh, the, the Senate bill that's coming out that's requiring that the age of the police uh, be a little bit higher and the education level be a little bit higher, uh, I believe it's AB uh, 89. Uh, I think that's something that needs to be enacted. And I think that'd be the first step into uh, making policing in America a little bit more equitable. Absolutely. So, uh, Mark, go ahead. And I would add, you know, I believe most inner city neighborhoods throughout this country are over policed, right? Uh, there's too many and they're they're policed by outside entities. I believe in more so community based policing. I, I believe the officers that are policing these communities should come from these communities, because if they don't, then these officers are looking at everyone as suspects. They're not looking at them as neighbors. I believe uh, officers who come from the communities where they are policing will will treat those communities with the dignity and respect that all human beings are worthy of. I believe there has to be a drastic change in the tactics that the average police officer learns. I believe that the police department should be demilitarized. Uh, they have weapons in some cases that they do not need. Uh, uh, and when they have them, eventually they're going to use them and they're going to employ them against the citizens in these communities. But I believe there does have to be drastic changes. I'm not calling for the abolition of police departments. I do believe there needs to be a presence in that community. But I feel that presence should come from that community and we would have more equitable outcomes as a result. Thank you for that, Mark. Uh, so uh, you already mentioned AB uh, uh, 89. A AB 89. I think the other parts that are necessary, because I think oftentimes police do not see us, or police see us as threats, especially black men and black boys. And so I think more community engagement, and what I mean by more community engagement, take off your uniform and coach some, some teams in South Central LA and Boyle Heights. And like, we don't need to know that you're a cop, but why don't you get to come know us? Uh, or maybe we need to know that you're a cop and, and, and get to know that people are human beings. They play, they, they have families, they have, they have friends. Like, stop looking at us as threats. Uh, and if, if you have more community engagement, it will be move from Senior Valley to South Central LA. How about that? And get to know the human beings that, that you're supposed to be serving and protecting. Uh, so that's one. The other part is definitely uh, education, more maturity. Uh, and, and I actually think people should, should be required uh, to take a certain amount of time and spend it in areas that they're going to police if they don't live there. I mean, literally, and not as a police officer, literally go spend time, go sit at the Starbucks, go sit in the park, go to Van Ness Park or, or St. Andrews Park, go to one of those parks and just hang out uh, and get to know people. But don't just go in and judge people. You have to know the human beings that, that, that you're supposed to be protecting and serving. And so. I think that, that should also be uh, part of the, the process. The, the last thing, and, and I talked about this when I talked about American Skin, police need to be trained in de-escalation. And one of the things in that movie was, the, the and, and I don't know anything about police training or anything, but the person in the movie said, we were always taught once we, once we pull out the weapon, our weapon, we do not put it away until we have the person that we deem the threat uh, uh, in cuffs or something like that. That has to change. If you see that as no longer a threat, then you shouldn't use your weapon. And one more thing I want to add. Uh, 
and this is this is this is something that really troubles trouble you. The young lady, uh, uh, I believe her name is pronounced, and if I pronounce it wrong, I sincerely apologize. Makaya Bryant, uh, who was, who, to me, I still think it was murdered. Like, I, I, yeah, I see what she, I, I saw the whole video. When you're a police officer, you have to go to a shooting range and train. And the question was asked, why didn't they shoot at her leg? And they said, the, the answer was, well, we don't shoot at the leg because if we miss, it's a smaller part and the bullet could go beyond her and hurt someone else. I don't know if that's an acceptable answer to me. If you're in the firing range and shooting to be able to be a police officer and you know how to handle a weapon, shouldn't you be able to at least, like, there was a car behind, I, I, I don't know, I just see, she should not be dead today. Uh, like, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm willing to be wrong, but in this sense, I just hate to see children uh, uh, pass away. If either one of you want to comment on that, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, I was I, I was going to talk a little bit about one thing that, that I forgot to mention is I do feel there needs to be more oversight in police departments from community members that actually has teeth in it where officers can be held accountable. I also feel that there needs to be more opportunity in these communities, right? Uh, because the more opportunity there is, the less likely someone's going to commit a crime. You know, I once heard the best way to stop a bullet is a job. And I believe that, you know, when young men have opportunities uh, uh, to be uh, uh, successful members of our society, they're they're less likely to engage in criminal acts. So I think a lot of money that's poured into these police departments could be poured into community based organizations that are out there doing the work and giving people opportunities. And then we would not need you know, to incarcerate so many people, right? Uh, because we definitely have to figure out a way to decarcerate our system and have less people in prison. Because a lot of times we see these individuals on TV being murdered, uh, uh, which is tragic. And it, it makes me mad every time. I can't even watch the George Floyd tape anymore because it sickens me that much. Uh, but we have the tendency to forget about how many people are sitting in prison as a, as a result of police contact. Uh, that's something that really, really has to change. And, and for me, you know, I I think we, we, we talk a lot about the systemic problems in, in policing, uh, but we also have to start really doing more of a, uh, of a background check or more of a check on the officers themselves. You have a lot of officers, they're gang members, they're racist. Uh, it's funny how I can catch a case in uh, 25 years. They can talk about stuff that I did when I was eight, nine years old, but they can't find out with, about uh, the police being racist. Uh, when they were 25 or 30 or while they were on the police force. Uh, and, and the point that I'm making is, is that uh, I, I think that as a community or as a, as a, uh, as a state, uh, a blind eye has been turned to the police for too long. And I was once told that sp sp suspicious behavior is something that's out of place. How would you know if something's out of place if you're not from that community? Uh, there's no way for you to know how that community runs if you're not there. And these guys are coming from these other communities with these other belief systems. And uh, there's not a lot of oversight on who's being hired. All you have to do is have a high school diploma and no felony convictions. So uh, any gang member or any racist can become a police officer. And, um, and we know that they're on the force, as Sam has said. And that's a problem that I think has to be addressed immediately uh, in figuring out who's going to be uh, police officers and who's going to protect and serve the neighborhood. Let me, let me ask you this question. Thank you for the objective and, and thank you for your response also. Mark. Let me ask, ask you this. How can we reimagine these systems to be more focused on protecting people and keeping people safe and cared for? How do we do that? First, you have to demilitarize the police. Uh, right now, the police are trained uh, force, 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 force. Uh, if, if, if you say something and they don't listen, you yell at them. If they don't listen in, then you become, you get physical with them. If that doesn't work, then you use the taser, then you use the gun. Um, and until we get to a point where uh, policing is done with compassion, when police officers come in there, their objective is to solve the situation without anybody going to jail or without anybody getting hurt and everybody going home safely. Until we get to that point, uh, I'm not sure how much progress we can make. Mark, how, how do we how do we reimagine these systems to be more focused on protecting people and keeping people safe and cared for? Definitely. Uh, uh, one of one of the things is opportunity, which I spoke about earlier. But I wanted to share a personal experience real quick. Uh, I was actually in the United States Marine Corps 
in there, they teach you how to shoot people center mass. So you're being taught that the only place to shoot someone is to shoot them to kill them, right? Uh, uh, if you're being taught this in police departments, this is a problem, right? Additionally, when I was in Okinawa, Japan, their police department didn't even carry weapons. I know this is something that's hard to imagine in the United States of America, but over there, their police officers literally didn't carry weapons. And it's the same thing for the country I was born in. I was born in Lake and Heath, England, and the average officer does not have a firearm, right? Every police in this country does not need to have a firearm because if enough people have it, they are going to use it. That's one thing that has to change. We also have to give opportunity and we also have to ensure, and I'm sorry to keep going back to it, but our citizens do not need to be over incarcerated, which a lot of times when the handcuffs are placed on, they don't see the light of day until decades later. And the last thing is implicit bias, because I myself, when I was young, suffered from implicit bias, just being honest. When I was a young black man, I looked at other young black men as threats. What I had to do is change this unhealthy belief pattern that I had. I had to identify, challenge it, and eradicate that unhealthy belief. And I believe that officers need to be changed, need to be trained in implicit bias, because in their case, the outcome could be death. So they do need to, to be trained in how to, to challenge that, that belief system and not view everyone as a suspect and not use force when it's not necessary. Uh, so they do need to be trained in, in implicit bias. And they also, some of them don't need to be armed. Every Thank police officer doesn't need a firearm. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm, I'm smiling because in the chat, uh, someone said, please elect Mark for public office or have him sit on the hiring committee to revamp criminal justice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like you gotta Mark, <laughs> Mark, you said something that, that really resonated too. When you were in the military, they taught you to shoot center mass. That's in the military because they're preparing you to potentially go to war. And, in the, and when you're in war, you're not trying to stop people uh, from, from, you're not trying to protect and serve people. You're literally trying to, sadly, you're, you're trying to kill the enemy. You're like, in wars, it's, it's not like you shoot the wound. You shoot to kill in the war. And so that's what they teach you in the military, center mass, uh, double tap, whatever we want to call it. Police should not be trained that way. How many form, former military people do we have that are police officers that only know that training? Shouldn't they be tra trained to either use a taser first or to arm, to, to, to shoot, to, to, to disarm, or to shoot to hurt but not kill? Like, shouldn't that be the training? Should, shouldn't it be, okay, I want to go less than lethal until I have to go lethal. And, and there are videos where they should, they were showing videos on CNN last night where uh, a, a white guy came out and he's got a mic, he's coming towards the police. The police take him down. What happened? Does it, does it change? And I already know the answer to this, but I'll say it anyway. Does it change when a person is black or white and they have a knife? I, I'll leave that right there and, and uh, just, in, in terms of reimagining uh, these systems, I think what it, what it has to go to, I think there are a couple of things that we can do too. When it comes to the recruitment of police officers, there should be a psychological test to see where their compassion is at. Because if a person's last thought is to harm, then their first thought will be to protect to care for. And so if, if we put those those in, in place and we train, revamp training, and we look to use less than lethal first, always first, that's your first thought. My first thought should be taser. And if possible, there's some areas that I think, yeah, we shouldn't even have to have so many guns. Like, And that, that's a whole different conversation uh, on the federal level when we talk about just having all of these weapons. Uh, but, but to your point, Mark, uh, yes. Uh, Every police officer, I don't think, if, if they can do it in other countries, why can't we do it here? Uh, that, that's, how, how come we can't? Um, how do we, how do, here's a good one, and we kind of touched on it already, but uh, how do we as a community advocate for reform and safety for all of us? Uh, Jacob and then Mark. Uh, one of the ways is, is, is always policy. Uh, we have to, we have to, we have to be more involved in policy as a community. Uh, black, brown, uh, Asians, uh, Native Americans. We have to be more involved in the process 
We have to believe in the process. A lot of our communities don't believe in the process, so we don't take part in the process. And our voices are not heard until something uh, terrible happens, like a young man losing his life at the hands of a police officer. Uh, we have to be involved more uh, in the process of building laws that are equitable for everyone, especially us. Uh, and that's something we haven't dealt, done well in the past. So I think that's that's one thing that we can do. And I, I would like to piggyback on, on what Jacob said. Policy is incredibly important and voting is incredibly important. You know, we, we vote on district attorneys who have incredible power. You know, we, we vote on police chiefs. We vote on governors. And if they're not treating our community members with dignity and respect, we need to vote them out of office and put someone in office who is willing to do that. And then when we start doing that, I believe the, the system will slowly uh, uh, shift. Additionally, I believe you have to have to give people access to resources. I really believe the more resources people have, the less crime you will have. Even a lot of our brothers and sisters coming out of prison, if you give them the right resources, they don't return to our communities as, as gang members. They return to our communities as ambassadors for peace. We see it over and over and over. Once you give them the right resources, they come back and they contribute to our society in definitive and meaningful ways. So I believe that's incredibly important as well. So I agree with you 100%, Mark. So so advocating for 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 more law, for, for better policies. Uh, for instance, one of the things that I would suggest, for, for instance, the sheriff has a, a community oversight commission now but that commission needs to have teeth in it, so to speak. And what I mean by that is this current sheriff that we have has basically thumbed his nose at, at this commission. Uh, so I would suggest when that happens, there should be a policy put in place where he's fined, not the sheriff's department, but the individual. As the leader of this department, okay, we're gonna take X amount of dollars out of your paycheck because you were elected and voted to protect and serve and lead to, protect and serve the community and lead this department. And if you can't respect the community oversight commission, then we're gonna find you every time you don't until you just broke or you leave office one way or the other, but there has to be teeth in a commission, a, 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 a sheriff's oversight commission. There has to be a way to force a person to actually listen to the community and, 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 and to protect the community. If not, the, the law has no power. You pass a law, it has to have some type of power. And I think for most people, I know for me, it, it's definitely true. If you hit me in my pocketbook, I'm gonna listen. You get a ticket, uh, are you gonna keep speeding? Are you gonna stop speeding? Because you don't wanna have to pay that ticket. And the same with uh, the current sheriff, just to give you an example, uh, I'm using that person. If you don't wanna abide by, by the laws that have been set by the community, then you have to pay a fine. And it, and it should be a hefty fine. So you know you might not be able to, to pay that light bill uh, this month and have to live in the dark because you didn't wanna listen to the community. At least that's what I believe. When we have policies, the policies must have teeth. Uh, and so they have to be enforced. For instance, if just what I said, if you speed, you have to pay a ticket. All three of us committed crimes and we spent decades in prison. OK, the sheriff thumbs his nose at our community, our, our community oversight commission. What is the punishment for that? So we have to we have to ask ourselves those questions. Uh, how does the community Here's a, a really great one. How how can officers repair the damage in community relations? Uh, I'm going to go to you first, Mark, and then uh, come back to you, Jacob. So so first, I would like to acknowledge there is a lot of damage. Uh, I mean, I mean, this has been since, you know, the inception of the United States of America as a country uh, uh, all the way through to today to to start to repair that damage. They they have to they have to treat everyone in the communities where, where they are policing, they have to treat them with dignity and respect. Until you begin to treat everyone with dignity and respect, uh, uh, you, will not, you, you will just cause further damage. You will cause further trauma. Uh, uh, and we need to have less police officers in our community. I, I remember when I was young, seeing them come into my community and take someone and you wouldn't see this person again for, you know, back then it was 10, 15 years. Now it's, you may never see them again at all until we change some of these uh, uh, policies, but I, I definitely believe that these officers need to be trained in de-escalation techniques, what uh, Jacob was saying earlier, and they need to be 
trained in how do you treat people with dignity and respect? And you brought up a good point earlier, Sam, that I really wasn't thinking about when I spoke on it. A, a lot of police officers do have military backgrounds, so they come in with that background. Uh, they have to be retrained so they know that, you know, the average citizen is not an en enemy combatant. That, that is not how you treat the average citizen. Uh, you treat them as a citizen. Of course, you know, I expect officers to be safe. You know, I, I respect, you know, people who don the military uniform and and straight police who do their job and protect and literally serve. Uh, uh, but I am against violence. You know, the work we do, the work we do as life coaches for the anti-recidivism coalition, when we go into these institutions, what we are treating with what, what we are teaching our students is anti-violence. There is all there is always another way. So when police officers are being unnecessarily violent, you know, they they have to be held accountable and they need to they need to be taught how not to be violent unless it is absolutely necessary. And even when it's necessary, it doesn't give you license to kill somebody. Great answer, um, Mark. Thank you, Jacob. I was once told that uh, violence is the lowest form of communication. So. I believe that police officers need uh, better communication skills. I think that a lot of times the interaction with the people uh, becomes disrespectful because they lack communication skills. Uh, all they're, they're in a position of authority and they, they've been trained to believe that as uh, long as they insert their authority, uh, they're on the right path. And that usually causes uh, a kind of a, a, a opposition between the officer and the, and, the, and the person that he's speaking with. So I will start off with communication training, learning how to be uh, more compassionate with your communication and, and taking time to, to look at the totality of circumstances. When I say totality of circumstances, I'm not just talking about the crime. I'm talking about, uh, does this person have kids? Are there kids out there? Uh, uh, who's in the communities watching? Is there a grandmother out there? You know, the, all this stuff, because when you talk about uh, respect and dignity for the for uh, people, uh, it has to start with the community as a whole. And so if, if, if you have an officer out there and he's doing a little kid bad, a little young black, brown, Asian kid bad out there, and there's grandmothers and kids and, and other community members out there, he's being disrespectful to them also. And so uh, stuff like that, the, the communication skills and, and, and being more aware and being more involved in the community where uh, you can see someone and say, you know what, that's Miss So-and-so, and, -so, and uh, let's be respectful around her. Um, and I think that comes with some of the suggestions you made about uh, maybe being a coach to some of the youth sports or or maybe just uh, or being working at the park on the weekends, ununiformed as a civilian. So so great, great answer. Uh, I, I, I know of a program that, that's pretty good. Uh, and, and so how do, how do we repair these damages in the community? So the Lakers partner with an organization called the Game Changer. Uh, uh, Sean Shepard uh, is, is uh, it's, uh, part of building bridges in the community. And what they do is police officers meet up with young people in the community. And sometimes they play sports, but they have these in-depth conversations on how, how to get better. And so I think like if you have time, please reach out to that organization of uh, the game changers building bridges with uh, basketball. It's an amazing organization that's partnered with the uh, Los Angeles Lakers Youth Foundation. I think that's one way. The other way, there's a, there's something that happens the last Sunday of every month uh, where LAPD actually provides a, a an escort for a peace ride that includes low riders, OGs, Corvettes, Harley Davidsons. And we go through Los Angeles and, and, and basically it's to promote peace. Uh, this Sunday, I believe they'll be having a ride. We usually meet, I think it's on 115th and Broadway. Uh, but uh, that interaction with, with LAPD is interesting because I've spoken to some of the officers. And one of the things that I noticed, most of the officers that actually provide this escort, and this has been going on for about eight years, are actually African-American uh, officers. And I've asked them questions about how do we improve this? And, and, and part of it, the community has to engage. We can't just say, uh, like, let's just get rid of them. We live in a law of land, a, a land of laws. How are these laws going to be enforced if we get rid of the entire police department? Uh, so, so that's the question uh, that, that uh, we definitely don't have the time to tackle, but something that we have to look at. Uh, uh, Jacob, when it comes to you, in prisons where we work, correctional officers have the authority and power. How can correctional officers be better custodians of the people in their care? 
Uh, it, 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 many of the suggestions we made earlier also applies to correctional officers. Uh, they have to treat people with respect. Uh, you need mental health experts. You have mental health experts there, but they don't respond until after the officers get there. Uh, we need mental health experts on an initial uh, contact with the person. Uh, also, uh, we need better communication. We need more um, more compassion training because I don't think a lot of officers are compassionate to people that are incarcerated. They feel like, you know what, you committed a crime and you're here to be punished. And it is my belief that prison is not punishment. Uh, going to prison is punishment. When I break a crime, when I commit a crime, my punishment for committing a crime is being removed from society and being sent to prison. Prison is actually uh, the community's investment into the rehabilitation of that person. Uh, that's why the budget is $14 billion, and that's why it's called corrections. And until we change that mentality that prison itself is, is punishment, um, we, we're going to continue to have problems. Uh, we have to go to more of a, a, a compa compassionate-based uh, model, uh, which will allow officers to be more human and not have to take that robotic role of, being a, a person of authority and not getting close to a person because he's incarcerated. And I, I, I would echo uh, what Jacob is saying, right? Uh, uh, one, once a person's incarcerated, they, sh they should have access to rehabilitative programming. Uh, they should have access to uh, uh, good health care, right? So a lot of individuals who come to prison are suffering from mental illness because that's America's response. We're, we're going to put them in prison if they're mentally ill. And then the, then the, the correctional officers have no training on the correct way to deal with this. Uh, uh, they've been trained in something totally different. And unfortunately, that causes problems. So definitely need me more mental health staff on site to deal with those mental health issues instead of it being a, a, a punishment issue. And we need more officers who actually support rehabilitation. And one last thing, I remember when I was incarcerated, you could have one bad officer come into the, the housing unit and it would change the attitude of 200 people instantaneously. And now there's there, there's this tension in the housing unit, which can which can have adverse outcomes. Or you could have a good officer come in, too. And then and that would cause everyone to, to have less stress. Right. So I believe they need to promote those officers who really stand behind rehabilitation, which is part of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation's mission is to return our, our community members healthy and whole. Uh, but we need more officers who actually support rehabilitative programming. Great, great point, Mark. Prisons are for rehabilitation only, not just uh, lock people up and forget about them. Prisons are not for profit. Uh, agree, agree 100 percent, Abigail. Uh, my suggestion when it comes to how, how do we how can correctional officers be better custodians of the people in their care? I say we take every single correctional officer and have them go spend a month in Norway. I had the opportunity to go in Norway's prison system and their, their officers, their correctional officers see themselves more, more as mentors. They will literally come sit at the breakfast table with you and talk to you and ask you how you're doing. Uh, they're, the way that they handle uh, situations instead of going from 10 down they start from a de-escalation uh, uh, model where they try to talk you down first. And so I think the first step would actually be retraining a, a lot of the, the officers. And, and matter of fact, I think even to your point earlier, Mark, when we look at these countries that have police officers like Japan that don't have weapons, maybe we need to go over there and take a look at how, how are they doing it? And maybe some of our officers should go over there and receive training. I mean, part of it is ultimately people have to see Police officers have to start seeing us as not a threat. We're citizens of this country. We're members of our communities. We're people that belong here. So stop seeing us as a threat. Stop shooting us and stop killing us and start taking into consideration that we're human beings. And that sometimes if you just stop for a moment, you'll find a better outcome. Um, hey, Sam, Sam, can I comment on something that Jose Vargas put into the comments? Absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, he put that COs have tra have training to remind them we're monsters uh, instead of uh, support and encourage rehabilitation. And I think that's part of the problem. I've been through a few uh, volunteer trainings at, at the CDCR facilities and uh, all the training is uh, 
Don't talk to this guy. Don't touch him. Stay away from him. He's going to manipulate you and he's going to kill your family. And he's going to he's going to do all these horrible things. And it's, there's no positivity in those trainings. And so if you train people to view people from that lens, uh, their actions of will uh, also follow uh, from that lens. And so we have to change the way people view um people who are incarcerated. And that's one of the things that the Hope and Redemption team does. It shows that just because a person was incarcerated doesn't make them less of a human being. In fact, uh, as Mark said earlier, uh, most people who's done extended periods of time in prison come out here with a, a community attitude of trying to make the community a better place. So uh, and we, we have to get into these trainings and we have to change the way that uh, officers or people are in authority view people of color. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're just about at time, gentlemen. Uh, I wish we could do a deeper delve in this. Uh, some of this is really touchy. Uh, it's, it's like emotionally charged. Um, but I want each of you to take a moment and, and last thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience. Uh, Mark, last thoughts. I would say uh, uh, I'm grateful that Derek Chauvin is at the very least being held accountable by the state. He still has to be sentenced. We don't know how that's going to turn out, uh, uh, but at least he was found guilty of what he was charged for. Uh, uh, police officers are not above the law. When they break the law, when they kill innocent people, they need to be held accountable for that. Uh, uh, until we start holding more officers accountable for misconduct, officers will continue to conduct themselves in that way because they've been given license to do so. Uh, so I hope as we move forward, one, that it doesn't happen, but history tells me it will. And when it does, those officers need to be held accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Jacob, last thoughts for our audience. Uh, you know, a police officer is the most powerful person on the planet. Uh, he's more powerful than the judge because he has the ability to, to make, to be judged uh, executioner right there on the spot. He can kill you somebody right there and, and, and deem him guilty and kill him. Um, and so a lot of these protections that we have, which make it so difficult to prosecute these officers really need to be looked at. Uh, do they need these protections? Protections? No one's above the law. So uh, if we if you have a justified shooting it's justified, you shouldn't need to be protected by the law. If the if the shooting is justified, if it's unjustified, you need to be held accountable and we need to get involved as a community. We need to get involved in the policy and start taking away some of these safe havens that these officers have to commit these violent acts and get away with them. And so my message to everyone is to get involved in policy and to uh, uh, to go vote. Thank you so much, Jacob. Greatly appreciate that. Last thoughts that I want to share. I want to just uh, remember uh, Dante Wright, Adam Toledo, Micaiah, Micaiah Bryant, and so many others whose names we can't forget. Uh, George Floyd, so many others. Like let's yeah, not forget them. Let's not forget them. As Jacob said, let's get involved in the policy change. And the other thing that I, I would really like to ask for all leaders, all leaders in this space, is to unite behind saving lives. The only way we went on this is if we unite. We have to have a united front to protect the lives of others. To protect, to protect the lives of so many that are being killed uh, without just cause. And so with that said, I just wanna ask you to reach out to each other, to me, I reach out uh, and let's find a way how we can unite and push back and change how policing is done, not just in California, Los Angeles, but in America. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody for next week. Uh, we'll be welcoming legislators, community organizations to expand on the discussion around the United States Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Commission. If you're not aware, if you're not aware about, not aware of this commission, this is something on a federal level that we all need to get behind when we talk about healing and definitely police murdering community members will be something that this commission can actually address. So until next week, y'all take care. God bless and stay safe.